Hello, hosts and travelers. Welcome to the podcast, Hosting Your Home. Each day around the world, millions of guests stay in other people's homes using the Airbnb platform. Debbie Herter looks for stories that come from these connections to share them with you. Listen in as we hear stories that teach us the human side of hosting your home. Off the Grid and 40 Feet Up is the name of the Airbnb listing of Alan Colley and Dabney Tompkins. Alan and Dabney are a couple who created a lookout tower to resemble the fire stations of old. And they've put an Airbnb at the top of it, and it is in huge demand. They are busy all the time. They are more busy than they actually can deal with. You'll hear that in the podcast. Tiller, Oregon, where their lookout tower is located, is four hours away from Portland and way out in the boonies. They had come into town for some reason or another and had lunch at the Airbnb headquarters downtown, which is not unusual. Our local Airbnb staff frequently asks hosts to come in and tour their property and their offices and see how they do their work. Well, Alan and Dabney got a huge surprise when they walked in and got a standing ovation from the Airbnb staff. Is that cool or what? They deserve it too. They're very charismatic. They do a beautiful job of of operating their Airbnb and you will really enjoy their story. Okay, so Off the Grid and 40 Feet Up is the title of this amazing Airbnb. And Dabney and Alan, what are your last names? My last name is Collie. Collie, C O L L E Y. Okay. And my my this is Dabney, and my last name is Tompkins, T O M P K I N S. Great, thank you, and thank you for being here on hosting your home. So this is the most amazing thing. How tall is this Airbnb? Well, the top of the tower is forty feet, and then it's probably another. 15 feet above that. The, f- the main floor is, yeah, the main floor is 40 feet above the ground. And then to the top's out at 65. So to back up, this is an Airbnb in Tilly, Oregon. Tiller. 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 Uh-huh. T-I-L-L-E-R, Oregon. Mm-hmm. And this is like a fire station tower. It's a fire lookout. Fire lookout. Right. Okay. It, it's right. not an original. We had it built okay. with a lot of things that don't, fire lookout towers don't have. So, for instance, this has running water. It has hot running water, and it has three beds, one queen-size bed and one and two single beds, and no Osborne fire finder, which sits in the middle of every lookout, and it, it's fixed to the ground and oriented to true north. So when they, they did have a fire, it would be you know, oriented so they could actually report where, uh, where the fire was. This thing... We wanted it to be our home, so totally different kind of mindset. Did you build this thing to live in? We had it built. Basically, we thought it was going to be a retreat from Portland, Mm -hmm. and then we decided, why don't we just break away from this and see if we could stand to live there full time. Well, so so here's what happened. Um, We... um, we, bu- we bought the land about a dozen years ago. We built this lookout about six years ago. Originally, it was just going to be a weekend getaway. And the weekends got longer and longer and longer. And finally, um, about a little over two years ago, we said, you know, what would it take if we wanted to live there full time? You know, what, what are all the components of what we would have to do financially to be able to do that? Mm-hmm. Um, because we're going to quit our jobs. You know, we're going to just go out there and live out in the in the woods, off grid. So um, one of the components of that was we leased our property here in Portland full time. The other one was we decided we would do Airbnb for a part of the year that would provide us some income. And then we had some other income sources that we could piece together that could make this work. And this was six years ago? Uh, no, this it? was a little over two years ago. Uh, okay. that we decided okay. to make this decision. I see. We, we, had, we had listed the condo in Portland on Airbnb whenever we went to the land. Okay. Uh, but, you know, that was kind of a totally different experience. And then when they, we decided to go down there to try to live there, uh, I think the, the big deal was, what are we going to have to put in place? 
And frankly, we didn't think Airbnb listing would be uh, any kind of a serious moneymaker because we're so far out in the middle of nowhere. Right. So. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we had a really good experience with our condo here in Portland when we did it on Airbnb. I used to always say we never met our guests. We literally would put the key under the mat. I'd call them a few days in advance, tell them everything about it. We'd come back after a weekend, and there was a pile of dirty laundry and $500 in the bank. And that was not a bad deal. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was kind of our experience. But we never, in that two years, I don't think we ever met a guest a single time. I think we met one guest. One guest. Interesting. Yeah. And so did you already have your property in Tiller? At that time, yes. yes. And why Tiller? Well... Well, this is a long story. You can edit as you wish. Okay. But um, we backpacked up here because we had the condo here, and we would go, you know, out into the wilderness and do that. And then somewhere we were taking a boat ride from Vancouver to Victoria, B.C., and on the boat we, they had a bookstore. So we went in there, and here was this book that said how to rent a, a fire lookout in the Pacific Northwest, and we bought it. And we, we immediately called the ranger uh, station in Tiller because they had all these uh, towers for, set, uh, for rent. We didn't even know such things existed. So we called, and the woman who answered the phone, we said, we would like to book that one next weekend. Is that okay? This is in September. She laughed at us and said, oh, honey, this is booked, you know, like the first five business day or first five hours of the first business day of the new year for the season. So she said, but I have a consolation prize, which was Picket Butte. And we got that one. And we stayed in that one several times. And then after a while, we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could figure out if we could find some land around here that would, you know, be this the same kind of experience. And then we went looking. So you went to Tiller because that was the place where these lookouts were already yeah. There. It's kind of ground zero okay. uh, in Oregon or in the Northwest for that whole, uh, the, the original historic fire lookouts. And that's where the most of them probably oh, are still existing. Okay. So it's very much part of the culture and history of that area. I see. So it was kind of a natural. I mean, when we walked into the Forest Service Ranger office and said, you know, we're going to buy this land and build a lookout. I mean, they were thrilled because that's, that's their heritage. And they really liked that someone was maintaining that. Are you firefighters? <laughs> We're urban guys. Oh, yeah. you know, we yeah, are yeah. so urban. <laughs> We're city slickers. That's what I always tell okay. the people down there. <laughs> and you bought how many acres? We bought 160 acres. Oh, my goodness. Well, it's interesting because the zoning down there is such that you can't build anything on it unless you have 160 acres or more. So if you have 159 acres, you can't build anything on it. And they do that so that people won't subdivide and then it'll remain rural, which was extremely attractive to us because we didn't, you know, it, we didn't want to have, uh, you know, anything, anybody near us. Our, our, we are completely surrounded by the national forest and our nearest neighbor is four three, miles, three, three, three miles, miles away. from us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. you are 20 miles away from town? Uh, uh, well, five miles that's away a- from town? Maybe it was 20 minutes and five. Maybe that's well, what I heard. Well, well, what's town? I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, a grocery store. No, uh, well, well, that's an hour. An hour. An hour. An hour okay. Right, yeah. All right. And that and grocery store is, is uh, it's sure. driving it a little bit because it's not much of a grocery store. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. So you, you have to plan really far in advance for grocery and gas because the last thing I, this has happened a couple of times, we drive up and we get to our gate and the. You know, the low gas meter or the alarm goes off. <laughs> yeah, we have to so figure out how long are we, we going to get back. <laughs> yeah. Oh. You yeah. coast down hills. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so your fire lookout imitation tower, I guess. Yeah, right. Is yeah. What I was, I'm not quite right. sure what to call it, is now an Airbnb. You don't stay in, any, in it anymore. You rent it out. And it it's for two or three or four or four four yeah okay. yeah right it can, it can sleep four we it call it a lookout four. tower we don't put fire on it okay. um, because we don't call it a fire lookout tower because okay. it's not prepared to handle sighting okay. fires so I so need it's to just correct my it's just a lookout tower. okay right and but I mean it is modeled after that I mean it has aspects <laughs> of what a what a historic lookout would mm-hmm. look like okay. and it's very much designed from that standpoint because we're so far out. We really need to be present when we have guests. Yes. Um, so 
we've been building our own what we call summer house, which is a little house, which mm -hmm. has been a whole nother adventure for us because we've actually been able to build our own house, which once again, we have no idea what we're doing. So in the morning when it's time to put the roof on, we have to go to YouTube and look up how you put a roof on. <laughs> oh, my okay, God. Then, okay, well, now let's see. How do you install hardwood flooring? I don't know. we got to go know. to YouTube. There must be a Google <laughs> instruction sheet. Yeah. yeah. And that's right. Oh. That's how we've done this. Yeah. What a hoot. Yeah. So. yeah. And it's been fun. So the first summer, we only did Airbnb in July, August, and September because we literally lived in a huge tent. And I didn't want to live in a tent when it was cold out or raining outside. No. Uh -uh. The second summer, we actually had the shell of the summer house built. It was finished on the outside, but it was you know just raw space on the inside. And then this summer, it's complete. We have running water there. We have heat. We have a you know a regular cook stove, just like anyone would have. We have electric lights, so it's like a regular little cabin in the mm -hmm. woods. And so we kind of go back and forth between living between the two of them. So our season goes from May first to November first when we rent it to, on an Airbnb mm -hmm. and we give ourselves, you know, space to have our own time there. But in the winter is when we live there. We, so we move everything oh, back up do? in the tower. Oh yeah. 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 So mm -hmm. we move back into oh, the tower. Oh, I guess I was thinking you moved back to Portland. No, 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 we're not ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. you're living there year round now. Yes, right. ma'am. We sure are. Right. Yeah. So that's oh. back to your question about, we decided we would try to figure out what it would take to live there full time. Mm -hmm. So, Originally, we said this is just going to be a one-year sabbatical. We're just going to do this for one year. And we actually leased our condo here furnished because we thought we'd be coming back in a year. And I told the tenants here is, is when they rented it, you know, there's no way it's going to go past a year. Get ready. So, get, you know, don't, don't think you're going to get to stay past a year. They said, okay, fine. Well, we weren't down there four or five months before we said, mm, a year's not going to be long enough. Mm -hmm. And so called the tenants and said, you know, if you guys want to stay, you can. And they have wanted to stay. And now we're in year three, so. And you yeah. quit your day jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, I was already retired, so he, okay. he quit his day job. That's a euphemism because right. our day job has become this. taking care of his land. Yes, right. And, yes. And you know, right. the, uh, the other thing that really is important is that we didn't realize what a difference it would be to meet the people who come. Isn't it amazing? We, yeah. we really didn't have that mindset. It wasn't part of the game plan in our mind. It was just, let's be here, make sure everything works. And so people don't get in trouble because, you know, solar and propane and water and all that stuff is, you know, you have to manage it. Mm -hmm. However, the cool part is we've met all these wonderful people. Yeah. And it, it's like, wow, we didn't think about this before. Well, the other thing, too, is we always tell our guests that we know that they didn't come there, there to see us. Mm -hmm. But if they decide they'd like to have a conversation with someone besides themselves, we're, we're it. it. Mm -hmm. So uh, they generally want to, I would say more than half of them, they just want to hang out with us. And we, you know, we have cocktail parties together and dinners and campfires and, you know, we... Take care. We take the kids on hikes and you know all that other kind of stuff. Or they so, help with the garden. I mean, yeah, that's they really critical for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you get, get water and electricity up there? There is a spring, or there are several springs, but water rights are a big deal in Douglas County. So you can't tap a spring that that actually exits your property line. So if it goes into the watershed uh, on the surface, that's not your water to play with. But we have a spring. That comes out of the ground, we capture it, and then it goes back into the ground where it's still ours. So we have we have a spring that we tap, and we have a holding tank for the water, and then it, then it's pumped up on a solar pump through a filter up to the lookout. And in the lookout, there's a small pressure tank upstairs that collects the water, and then it gravity flows back into the lookout itself. So it feels just like a regular, you know, faucet. You you wouldn't know the difference. And as I have to often tell guests, they probably couldn't use all the water up, but they can use all the electricity up. So they can't just like let the water run for hours because eventually they'll run the batteries down, the solar batteries that send it up there. And yeah. is it solar heated or is it electric heated? It's uh, Pro propane. It, propane. Oh, propane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, we have a big 500-gallon propane tank. It heats the water. Uh, we have um, a propane cook stove. We have propane heater, and we have a propane refrigerator. And we have kind of like those Coleman lanterns. Oh, uh, you know, oh we have sure. and, uh -huh. and we used to use those exclusively. They're just not bright enough for us to read by. So we added um, some LED lamps, which run by solar. It hardly uses any energy at all, and it's 
very bright. And that's renewable, you know, provincially yeah. not right. renewable, but, right. but the solar right. is. So. so how are your bookings? Well, it's funny you would ask that. When we first did this, I had read that tree houses, as they called them, were very popular. Yes. And so I knew it would be popular. But being out in Tiller, we thought it would take people forever to uh, be able to, to find us. I input the listing in less than an hour. We had our first booking. Mm-hmm. And then in two, within two weeks, the season was gone. And wow. So, yeah. Right. So then I said, okay, the next year, which was 2015, so last year, uh, we will not open the season calendar until March 1st because we didn't want to commit to hosting on when we didn't really know what our schedule was going to be. On March 1st, we opened our calendar, and I think we booked the whole season in a couple of weeks. So then I made the mistake of telling people that we were going to pencil them in, which meant that we didn't really commit to hosting, but we would hold the dates for them for for this year, for 2016. Mm-hmm. And so the reason I say it was a mistake was it was a huge amount of work on the part yes. to, to track all that. Yes. And then when it came time to book, half of them didn't book. And so, oh. um, you know, well, and I can understand that. I mean, mm-hmm. they were, some of them had reserved with us a year and a half earlier. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the Life's urgency true. is not there anymore. Mm-hmm. This year, I decided that, that it would be the last year we did it that way because I already promised people that on June fifth of this year we would we would start holding dates for twenty seventeen. So if they were twenty seventeen was gone in about three hours. Yep. So Caitlin was here trying to book. Yeah. And she was <laughs> yeah. she she was yeah. we're trying to do yeah. her interview, which yeah. is and she was trying to keep up with all this. Right. Yes, yes, I know. Yeah, so I've been telling everybody, you know, it's okay. I can't promise you anything now because there are no dates left. But I also know half of them won't book. And so March 5th, whoever hasn't booked will open up the remaining dates. And I'm sure they'll be gone in an hour. So yeah, That's right. An hour. And at that point, you'll be calling all these people or notifying the people that are on your wait list? We basically send them an email saying it's open and you guys are in. You fight for it. Yeah, so, you figured it out. Oh, yeah, so, we, so you send a blanket e- email out to, to everyone? To the people who have asked to be on yeah. that list. We, I used to do the wait list thing, and I would kind of let people go in the order that I... But that mm-hmm. that becomes a problem because you can't wait for people to respond. Because right. some people you know, respond to an email right away. Some people don't respond for three days. Right. So now what I've done is I've said, you know what? We're just going to have a cancel... We, I call it a cancellation notification list. So it's a list of people that want to be notified if we have a cancellation so that they don't have to go check the calendar constantly to see if we've had a notification because it, I, I can't notify them. Uh, it's just too much Well, trouble. and using the Airbnb platform to do that must be horrendous. It, yeah, yeah. we push that envelope system. really big time. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll get to a point where we'll be like Barb Wetzel, the woman I told you who laughed at us when we asked if we could just rent that uh, mm-hmm. particular tower because mm-hmm. I think we're going to say, it's booked. I'm sorry, come back next year because yeah. we've got repeat people coming yes. now and the people who wait until the thing is open is amazing because they will pounce when they're yeah. there because mm-hmm. they're highly energized to come. Do you have a website? For this? Mm-hmm. We have a, a, a Facebook page that says it's Summer Prairie. But it's just it's, it's just, just for the place. It's not yeah. about the list. Oh, you don't no. take bookings from your, no. from your Facebook oh, page? No. That's a, so the only place you take your bookings is Airbnb. Oh, right. I mean, to me, that would be way complicated when we, when we don't really need more exposure. We don't. Uh, right. you know, it's easier for me to just have one place to deal with it mm-hmm. uh, than to have a lot of different places. People have offered to help us publish, you know, I mean, publicize this, and we say, yeah, Can't handle we don't it. need this. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, that overcomplicates it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I mean, we regularly have people now that are wanting to book 2018 and 2019 with us. But um, I'm just like, I, I can't even think that far out. I will say, on the one hand, it sounds really nice to, to have people that want it that much, but it is a huge hassle to keep up with that. It really becomes problematic. We try to uh, leave dates up on the calendar so people can actually contact us because I think it's extremely frustrating for someone that, to want to come to a place and they, there's just no way they can contact the host mm-hmm. because you have to have open dates to be able to contact the host. Yes. And so I leave dates in 2018 open so people can do that, but then they try to actually book those, even though I tell them that they can't book them. Be- so. Because that seems to be the only way that they think that they can book it right. or right. get a hold of us. Right. Right. And then we decline them. 
So, you know, which is uh, this is kind of a funny story because Airbnb is set up so that if you decline ten reservations in a row, they'll kick you out. Right. So we get kicked out about every three weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, are you are you super host? I was, we yes, are super host. Yeah, they can't do that. Well, yes, well, they can. Like, the algorithm is set up. We, so we, and they've ta- they've apologized profusely to us uh, about that. They said there's no way we can change that. Please just click reactivate whenever we do that. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Oh. oh, you guys are you are you are, you are bucking the system, yeah. aren't you? We, yeah. You're giving well, them a many headache. dimensions. Yeah. <laughs> we have long conversations. Well, the whole the whole thing, the way that we pencil in people is really using their calendar the way it's not designed. Right. Because what happens is some we I open the calendar up, people request dates, I decline the dates, I then remove them from the calendar with a note that that person that I'm holding them for that person. Mm-hmm. Then I start <laughs> the email so I can their email so I can find, find them to email them back the next year. So you can see how that just... But and it, you it, have to do that, otherwise you can't communicate with exactly. them. Exactly. Some of them want specific dates, so it's not like they're going to be interested in anything. Right. But generally, when we've had a cancellation, it lasts about 10 minutes. So I go to the list, I send the link, I say, these dates are open, if you want it, book now. And then they just book it. So that when people say, well, I'll just watch for a cancellation, you'll never find them. They just don't happen that way. So you, you contact the people before you open the dates? So they can get um, it? No, or? it's right then. Okay. Um, because, you know, when someone, can, if someone cancels, then it automatically opens the dates in the calendar. So when I know what they are, I just blind copy the list and just say, these dates are now open. Here's the link. If you click on it and it's not there anymore, that means someone booked it. Mm-hmm. I think we, we had a couple of cancellations early in our season and I don't like that. Do you have a two-night minimum? Mm-hmm. Some time ago, you may not want to do this, but just FYI, some time ago, one of the vacation rental marketers that I'm connected with, and he says that once you get full, you should be raising your prices because mm-hmm. you want to keep some things open. Mm-hmm. So as you raise your prices, then that kind of cuts down on the number of people who will mm-hmm. book with you. Let, let me respond. Yeah, yeah, go, go right quick. ahead. Yeah. I think one of the things we work with our pricing strategy is the kind of audience we really want to have there. I understand. And yeah. we know that as we increase the price, it becomes less affordable for some of the, the demographic of the people we really like uh-huh. and want to be around. Uh-huh. And we're prepared to do a certain level of activity, and, and but I don't want it to be precious. Mm-hmm. I don't want it to become... So expensive on the one hand, but also it's this idea that, well, the, the sheets aren't perfectly ironed. Mm-hmm. I mean, or the, I want a chocolate on well, my pillow. Mm-hmm. That kind of a uh, person is not well, who we want. Exactly. You know, and at some point, $200 a night for something that just has an outhouse is a little much, mm-hmm. you know? Right, that's true. I mean, as much as you can get people to pay that, I mean, is you know, it doesn't even have a bathroom in it. Yeah. So... So let's talk about the bathroom for the okay. podcast here. People are really going to want to know. So they know that they've got a shower, they've got a hot shower, and they've right. got water right. upstairs, um, but no bathroom upstairs. No. Yeah. Why would you put and, in the house? Why would you do that? And, and, <laughs> one, one, one of the old hippies that lives around there uh, had a friend that for years and years didn't have indoor plumbing and finally got indoor plumbing, but... He never put a bathroom in, and they it was said, never why? toilet. Yeah, yeah. They said, "Why didn't you? Why didn't you put a bathroom in your house?" And he said, "Why would you put that in your house?" <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, as we tell our guests when they come stay, we have four potty options. Mm-hmm. So, potty option number one is basically the pit toilet. Mm-hmm. Potty option, number which I heard was a very nice. It's pit a very toilet. nice. As pit yes. toilet, it is very nice, and it even has uh, a chainsaw formed bear that holds a toilet paper for you. Do you so have a picture of it on your? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, oh yeah. Okay. yeah, Pooh Bear, as we call him. Oh cute. <laughs> <laughs> so when 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 you need to go to the bathroom, you call it. I need to go visit the bear. That's what the, that's what we say. <laughs> Potty option number two is the pee funnel, and uh, many women have found that to be very male centric. Yeah. So we give every woman that comes there a go girl, which is one of those. <laughs> And they're all delighted. I don't well, think they like Well, some of them are right. embarrassed by it right. because, yes. you know, right. whatever. But the ones who get into it, man, they are experts by the yeah. time they leave and they're proud <laughs> to tell us. <laughs> um, potty option number three is upstairs in the cupola, which is where the sleeping area, the Queen's House sleeping area is, which is kind of up a ladder to that area. So we have a little, basically a pea pot up there so that. Because you don't want to go down that ladder in the middle of the night to either go all the way down to the bear mm-hmm. to or lights down mm-hmm. and, or even to the pee funnel. And then potty option number four is what my mother calls the kitty litter box. We call it the emergency potty. It's a, it's a portable camping. It looks like it has you know a seat, but it also has a bag to capture. 
and uh, some kind of a powder that you know absorbs the moisture. And it's you know it's something people use if they can't move fast enough, mm-hmm. or, it's the, or if it's three a.m. and they don't want to go down four flights of stairs mm-hmm. into the woods. So. Yeah. How how many steps down? It's from or the up. from the f- ground. It's sixty six steps. Okay. And I have a name for every one of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and there are four landings, so you can stop and admire the view and catch your breath. Because we are oh. at 3,500 feet above oh. sea level. And many people come from sea level. Well, this is like Portland, I think, is 75 feet above sea level. So you're, you know, your uh, oxygen intake is a lot more restricted at that level. <laughs> but there's a lot to see. I mean, we've got a view that won't quit, so... Uh, you can stop and say, I'm really just checking the view, not really catching my breath. But And do you have a lift of sorts to haul up the no. coolers? And We are the dumb waiters. Oh, yeah. are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's Except fun. for Dabney. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that means okay, all right, power. whatever. Yeah. It's funny because the, 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 the Forest Service lookouts all have a pulley, you know, a pulley on it. Uh-huh. We always said, you know, the par- part of the reason is if you if you rent one from the Forest Service and you're taking your blankets and pillows and all that stuff up there, but and, for, and water and water, right? You got to carry the water. Um, but for us, it's really just laundry and groceries that we're taking up and down there, and you're going to have to go up a flight. And you're going to go up there once anyway, so it hasn't really been that necessary. There have been some moments where we I will I see a, a winch. Um, you know, yeah. could be helpful, yeah. but we're not there yet. Well, you guys are both in great shape. <laughs> yeah, we well, have, we were we have tra- a built-in stairmaster. When we were, when we were trading out the uh, the car batteries, that were, you know the, the 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 batteries for the solar system, the solar power system. That was when I really wished we was carrying these things, carrying are four car oh, batteries up four flights of stairs. Oh so, wow! Yeah. Well, and getting the beds up there. Uh, I, I'm assuming they're. They, well, this is no. They're, real mattresses? They're, they're actually built in. Oh, um, are but they? But they have. Do they do have real mattresses? The mattresses were the only thing they had to bring up there. Mm-hmm. Um, we could fold their foam mattresses, you know, memory yeah. foam. So, mm-hmm. you know, roll them up and stuff them through the hole, and still they're massively heavy and cumbersome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But we could never have gotten them up if they had been standard beds. And the the sofa. Did I say the sofa is that kind of a built in? Yeah. It's, oh, that's it's, yeah, it's one of the beds. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. That's built in. Okay. Yeah. So do you do you have your uh, income allocated for certain things? Do you use it to travel with, or you put it back in the property, or buy a new car? Buy a new car. Well, <laughs> last year um, in April, so the month before we opened, we went on we went on a month long trip to uh, Spain and Morocco. We were going to do another big trip this year, but I somebody I slipped on. Yeah, I had to have knee surgery when I fell, which is another reason we don't have guests there in winter because there's just a lot of things that could go wrong. Um, you know, the water pipes could freeze, the solar power could go out if we have a lot of uh, cloudy days. You could slip on the steps and bang up your knee, and that's you what get, I, that's what you did. That's what I did. Yeah. yeah, you could get snowed in because the Forest Service does not plow the road. Mm-hmm. And we didn't get snowed in, but we got snowed out this winter because we were actually here in Portland. And the day before we went back, they had a really heavy snow, and it was a foot and a half. Well, you know snow. the wet snow you had here in de- early December. You had we had it too, but we had two and a half feet of it. Oh. Yeah, and it knocked over about I don't know hundreds of trees over the road on the road. Oh, dear. And so it took four, uh, I think four days for we just had to wait for the Forest Service to be able to go up there and cut the trees down. The snow to melt enough for us, and then <laughs> even then we couldn't even we couldn't get to the lookout. We could only get up to our gate, and we had to. Drag everything up the last five hundred feet. Wow. Yeah, we all, we often say if the f- the first winter was a really easy one, and we often say if, if the first winter had been as difficult as the second one, we would we would have come. We back probably got yeah. come back to Portland. <laughs> so your season runs through October. So mm-hmm. you that you have given yourself a nice big cushion for bad weather, right? So you right. don't have to deal with this. You don't have any disclaimers. You don't need to do that no. with people because well, uh, the bad weather we have in the wind in the summer is if we have fires, and oh. we had a very very major fire out our front door last summer. Well, oh. out our front door, we watched it, yeah. but it was six miles away. Uh-huh. But it was oh, very visible. The side of a creek. And, uh-huh. um, it was interesting because we ha- we had you know we were all booked with guests during that time, so I started to call them as this fire was developing and saying, I'm not sure if you're going to want to come or not. Every one of them wanted to come. Mm-hmm. Some of them, like we had a couple from um, 
Canada that were on their honeymoon. And as he said, we don't have any other place to go. And Which I felt was terrible like, for them. Right. But we, we got into a level two evacuation where it's where they tell you to pack your car because when we call, you have to leave now. So we had guests there that night, and I told them, I said, you know, I don't want to be the one to tell you to stay or not to stay. And they said, mm, I think we should leave. And so they went, they'd stayed one night and they left the next day. And it was really a miserable night there. It was so hot and so smoky and unhealthy smoky. And I, she's wanted to come back since then. And I've said, you really, really made the right decision by leaving because that was really not a good yeah. situation. So we know fire bans begin now. Uh-huh. Um, fortunately, it rained like crazy the last couple of days. So we're postponing that. Yeah. Now in June. Mm-hmm. Right. Last year, the fire ban started June 24th. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, that means all fires are prohibited, period. And so then it progressively got drier. And the, what we've learned a lot about forest fires as a uh, result of this. You have a fire pit there, too. So do mm-hmm. you uh-huh. do you just monitor that carefully? We, we or couldn't do you light a, a fire. You could not have a fire mm-hmm. in your fire pit either? No. Well, last summer, yeah. I mean, we're not there yet this okay. year. Pro- but we probably will be in a month okay. uh, where we can't. And we couldn't even light the fire for the fire wood fire hot tub, which is down yeah, the hill. Which is another okay. problem too, because I yeah. mean people want. But it, you know, we tell them in, in our list there, you know, that if, if, if it happens, then we're we mm-hmm. can't do anything about it because mm-hmm. we're we're restricted from doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the humanity of this a little bit. You know, tell us about some of your guests. What are you getting out of this? You know, give us some of your some of your warm fuzzies. Okay, I'll tell you about my, one of my favorite is, you heard from Michael and Caitlin, so Mm -hmm. the first summer we were there, we had this guy from Honduras that contacted me and said, I want to propose to my girlfriend there. And I said, great. He said, she loves stars, you know, are the stars going to be out in August? And I said, I don't know. (laughs) Uh, So anyway. Apparently they met on the beach in Honduras somewhere, and that was where it became magic for, for them. Because starry night, all that stuff, and he wanted stars. Oh, lovely! So, so we got we got in cahoots with him on this deal. So we arranged to get all these roses for him. I'll tell you how he set it up in a minute, and a lot of other stuff that he wanted that he could set the stage for this. So the day they were supposed to arrive, he said, "You know, we're going to be there at you know like two in the afternoon." I said, "Okay, that'll be great." Well, then he called me later on and said, "Well, I think it's going to be more like six o'clock." And then he, well, I think it's going to be more like nine. Well, then before we know, they don't get there till midnight. Oh, my gosh. And they, they get, one of our neighbors five miles away calls and says, there's this couple from Honduras that's lost. And I'm like, oh, they, yeah, they belong up here. And so we finally got them up there. She was so mad. And he was going to propose to her that night. And I was thinking, you better you not, not do it You tonight. should not She's do this tonight. No. Bad She's choice. <laughs> So anyway, so the next night he said, "Okay, I'm going to do it the next night." So, so what what they did was he um, took all those roses and he he spread them all across the floor and he took little tea lights and put them all on the floor and he had her go upstairs and put on a nice dress and um, he took so long putting this together that she fell asleep and because, no <laughs> and he had to wake her up yeah and. You know, it was a starry night, so you know, for good for him. But here were all these rose petals all over the uh, floor and these tea candles. And then he got her out on the porch, and it's cold. Stars are clear, but it's cold. So then he takes his jacket off and puts it in a, uh, That's where the ring was sitting. Bang. And she said, and this dang thing was banging on my leg, and it was really annoying. And then he got on his knees and started singing this song that he made up on a guitar that they had brought. She's a guitarist. He can't play a guitar. And then he proposed, and, and then in the pocket, he said, pull that out, and here's this plastic puzzle that you have to line everything up with to open it. Oh, my goodness. And she said, I'm not a patient person. And she got it open in five minutes, and he was thinking it was going to take her 30. <laughs> so anyway, we didn't, we didn't know. <laughs> did I, she say yes? Well, no, okay, she so, did so say yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we didn't know next, a thing. So, and we thought, so no. you know, we, by this point, you know, we, it, it was late. We, we, he was said, I'll, I'll, I'll send you a text message and let you know. I, we fell asleep. We were, you know, we were down <laughs> to the summer house. So the next morning, it was time for them to leave. And, you know, they were milling around, packing up. And we went up there to tell them goodbye. And we were kind of waiting. He kind of comes down the stairs and he kind of walks up and he goes, hands in the pockets. He goes, she said yes. 
<laughs> and so then, and then a few minutes later, she, she keeps running downstairs. Running she wants to show us her ring and all, all that. Yeah, that was cool. So that that was, yeah. that's neat. We've had several. Uh, well, I count five. Uh, I think Michael, we had five. I Mike, think, Michael I think Kate and Michael were our fifth proposal. So, so what, how did that go? Did they did they talk to you? We didn't even know that they had done it, but she, but they came down to see us at the summer house and. And she said, and, you know, last night Michael proposed, and, you know, with the ring all out. And we, you know, so like, well, how cool it, is well, that? Well, they came down. We were, you know, visit, 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 talk about this. They had been our guests the year before, so mm-hmm. we were just catching up on what had gone on since then. And they watched the summer house progress, so they were interested in that. And talk, 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 talk. And finally, you know, they were about to leave, and Michael says, Hey, don't you have just something to say? You tell him something else that happened. <laughs> oh, yeah, he proposed to me last night. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. it, what, what was so cute about that was that you know they they didn't have cell phone service, so they couldn't call anybody and tell them. I said, "Well, you can use my phone if you want to call your mother or something." And he said, "Oh, he's already told my parents that he was going to do that." So. And that whole story about how he got the you know when they his parent her parents came and he got he, he at the very last minute as they're leaving at the airport, you know that story. <laughs> Um, but rushed. our guests don't. So go oh, ahead. well, part of it was, I and mean, Michael should tell this story. Uh, but we'll have a little bit. He of made he made this excuse as they're leaving. It dropped her parents off as they're leaving. He said, "Oh, I really got to go to the bathroom." She's kind of let their ex suspended while he goes in to go to the bathroom, but really wanted to ask her dad for uh, permission to marry his daughter. Uh, so she he, she said that was the fastest. Episode and then he came back and was all smiling and she had really no idea. <laughs> Great stories. Another another story that I just, I just love is a woman had been recently divorced and she brought her uh, her three sons, twin boys and an older boy, it was thirteen and I guess they were nine when they came, and so she just wanted another experience that these kids had had with her. So they came. The boys helped water our garden. So and she got. You know, time in the hammock, which is great. And their oldest son would always come down in the morning with his glass of milk for a splash of coffee to have coffee with us on the porch. Yeah, coffee with the guys. <laughs> and so, uh, that's very, that was very sweet of him because yeah. he's 13. You're kind of starting to you know, like feel like you're an adult, yeah. sort of. And he, that was really a charming thing for him to do. It was. And so I, I love that story. And your guests... Water the garden. Do they do oh, other things in the garden? No, we we basically say if you want something in the garden, yeah, help yourself. Okay. But most of the time, so, so, so we have a ritual about garden watering, and that is we always do that right before happy hour. So we go down, we water the garden, and then we go have happy hour. So we always tell them, you know, it's kind of pre happy hour. We all go down, <laughs> water the garden together, and then we'll all go drink. We had um, oh, lovely. a a couple come. This is the first season, and they're from Vermont. He's a landscape architect. His wife is a co-chair of a organic GMO. Uh, people who are expanding their, scaling up their businesses, but want to remain true to their non-GMO work. Mm-hmm. She helps them find sources for this so that they can scale up. Anyway, mm, cool. they went shopping one day to, and they found all these organic uh, sources for food, and they invited us up. And they had a spread on our table of all of the stuff that they had made. And we had an amazing happy hour with them. Those kind of episodes are the quality that we really cherish. It was stuff we did not expect. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would say now I, I tell our guests, every guest is a potential friend. Mm-hmm. And many of them have become friends. So, When we come to Portland, almost every trip we're here, we do something with one of our guests that's been down there. Um, you know, we go to dinner with them or we go have drinks with them or something. Almost every time we come here. Yeah. And do they know about your Facebook group after they come and stay with you? Do they then join your Facebook group afterwards, kind of keep the community going? We haven't even gone there with that. So that's oh, a is that right? Idea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, the Facebook page is really just about the land. It's not really about. The we don't ground. tell stories about the guests we've had. We uh, we actually. That's don't really interesting. interesting. You I'm actually might that. create a community around yeah. that. One of the things we we talk about a couple summers ago was we'd love to be able to capture our guests' experiences. They write them in a, a you know we have a journal on the mm-hmm. on the premises that people write little snippets on what they enjoyed and all that. And then of course there's the reviews on the platform. But what I wanted to do, and I still want to do this, is have them capture the memory 
that was special to them? What did they discover that they wouldn't have discovered otherwise? Mm-hmm. And so we can start to share that, and the, probably that's a good platform to do that. We just yeah. haven't, haven't taken the time that. to explore I just, I actually, I just hadn't thought of that. Yeah, because I know that some of these people are really connected, but th- maybe not even know it. Mm-hmm. Connected to you and oh, for, through you, you know, right. possibly with each other too. Right. So that that would be a very yeah. cool thing to do. I agree. And I it just thinks it just sounds so scrumptious. Yeah, what we what we do have, and this is kind of a copy of the fire lookout rentals that the Forest Service does. We have journals, mm-hmm. and you know, people are spending a lot of time there reading and doing things, so they enjoy reading the journal. They write. Some people draw pictures. Some people yeah. write poems or songs or whatever in there, and it's it's fun, especially if if they know people. That, oh, I know that person. You know, because we have a lot of people that come. That are friends of friends, and that you know, mm-hmm. they hear about it through that, so they enjoy reading what other people's entries. It's like a big diary, I guess. What's the average stay? Probably three nights. We we have a two night minimum, and we, you know, it's interesting you said about moving to a three night minimum. I would think that you would end up with more of those odd two nights if you do that, and of course, I guess at a later date you could book up the two nights mm-hmm. if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. I usually think that because it's a pretty far drive from Portland, I mean, it's over four hours, that to only come for two nights is really not a, a long enough. Um, if, if they're going to have two whole days there, they should spend one day there on the property and not go anywhere because it's a, a, you know, it's a really nice, peaceful place to be. And then if they're going to be there a second full day, then they can go to Crater Lake or they can go to South Uncle Falls or they can go to the river or Ashland or whatever they want to do for the day. However, uh-huh. they don't know that. Until they get there. Yeah. They yeah. don't know. For five, five hours is one thing. Yeah, okay, it's a five-hour ride. But they don't get how impactful it is until after they've been on this property. And then they say, I don't want to go home yet. Yeah. But you can't tell yeah. them that initially. Yeah. They've got to have that experience. And it's yeah. the repeat people who want to stay longer because they already know, oh, we're not leaving. the. We're, not stay, we're staying right here. We're not going anywhere. And I uh, think that happens when you get people who've already experienced it or have shared that with other people that are coming, other friends. And I do think that that's something that's coming, but I don't think we're ready for it. We used to call it going home blues because nobody wants to leave. They all hang out. It's too important to leave. How do you uh, how do you separate out the work? Who does what? Well, when it, you, you're talking about when we're doing a turnover or something like that. No, I, I oh. reservate from the beginning to the end. He's primarily the, the computer guy. It, uh, Dabney, Dabney does, does all that. Yeah. We share everything else. I mean, he's pretty much the, the systems guy. He pays attention to the water and the pump and the solar stuff. Mm-hmm. This past winter with the leg, I've had to pick up some of that. But generally, we share cleaning and turnover and laundry and all the stuff that goes with it, making sure the place is ready for guests all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what we share equally, and it almost doesn't matter who does it. I make beds. And the gardening? Well, we share that. We're totally, that's our our thing to do. That's great. Building a cabin is also our thing to do together. We've learned how to do that. What a partnership. It's great. (laughs) Cutting down trees, making, splitting wood for fires. Perfect. We learned how to do that, too. Were you Boy Scouts? I was. I was a oh, I was a Cub Scout. Either? Yeah, that didn't teach him a thing. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, trust me. <laughs> no. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Now, can we talk about this latest adventure that you're yes. hatching the up? Premise was we we knew we were bringing people into the community that had never experienced this before. And it's really quite special. He's the treasurer of the farmer's market in Canyonville. I'm on the board of this restoration of the watershed. Where's Canyonville? Exit 99 on I-5 South. It's, so it's a Where the Seven Feathers Casino is. <laughs> Most people south know of Roseburg, yeah. north of So Medford. how far away is that from your... Place? It's an hour drive. An hour that's, drive. that's going to the big city for us. It's okay. going to Canyonville. Okay. So, which is not a big city. When we realized we were bringing people in who had never experienced this kind of rural, really rural setting, we thought, you know, there's a lot of people here who could really participate in this if we would just sort of reach out to them. Mm -hmm. And how do we get more people into the the mix? Because it was was two-pronged things. We can't, with this booking being booked through, you know, 2018, we knew we weren't going to be able to increase the volume of people coming in. And 
it was going to take some time to nurture and mentor other hosts in the area, which is another part of the strategy. So we thought, what about if we did a camp weekend, a retreat of some kind where people could come at a lesser cost, we'd do food, and they would bring their tents and all that, and that's what started it, so we could start to embrace the community with their skills and talents. So off we get yeah, so originally we were going to we were going to call it summer camp for grown-ups. That was our original idea. It was going to be like you know when you went to summer camp, and you could come and stay two, three, or four nights. We would pick a weekend each month that was going to be you know one of the summer camp weekends, and um, bring your own tent. Bring your own tent, so and you, you have, have a meadow site. It looked like yeah, we have a forty-acre okay. meadow. So, okay. Yeah, so there's plenty of places to, to pitch your tent. And you can put it, pitch it in the woods too, for that matter. I mean, there's just all the room you'd need. My brother, who is a, uh, he's a hotel chef, has come for the summer to basically do this these events for us. And we've had large events up there before for our friends. I don't know, we had 40 people camping there last summer. And we had an event for 80 people, which is, you know, when you're out in the middle of nowhere, is a pretty big deal. Pretty and big deal. What kind of event? Well, we called it the hoedown, but it was basically, um, we had three or four nights and we had our friends from Portland came and camped and um, we didn't do food for all of them, but we had entertainment at night and, you know, was that sort of thing. It was a big party that we mm-hmm. put on basically. We got married right after Oregon permitted marriage, mm-hmm. but it was very private. We just did you know, the, the required five people, but everybody was really angry with us because we didn't invite them. Yeah. So we said, you know what? It was going to take a lot of work to get a lot of people from a long distance away to do this. So next summer, which was last summer, uh, we would do a big, huge hoedown, not to celebrate our wet, our marriage, but to celebrate them as our part of our large family. How lovely. So we did that. And that's where we got 80 people. Tom came up, Tom's brother, and we roasted a giant pig, and we made all the food for all these people. They camped on the land. They That was the first time we'd ever done anything like that big wow. out there. And so this year, uh, we're, we're going to make it more regular, but for a smaller group of people. Yeah, so the idea is that we engage the local community in some of their own skills. And mm-hmm. so that we're trying to bring prosperity to the whole area. And it's more than just people offering rooms. Like we have a friend that is a, that is a yoga, and she's going to come up and do yoga on the meadow. And then we have... Another guy who is a expert at beaver re- relocation, so he's going to do tours to, to beaver habitats and dams. Awesome. I realize we're not going to change economy as small as we are, but we can be a catalyst for that. Mm-hmm. And that economy is really hurting. You know, they've been in the mining and, and timber industry for years, and, you know, they're running out of lumber and, and minerals. And so, you know, they, they, they need to go to a plant B. And, We're actually uh, nurturing that whole mindset shift. Well, it was yeah. really interesting. We did kind of a test run on this, and we invited Airbnb guests from the office here to come down and kind of go through this with us so we could mm-hmm. figure out beta, where the kinks beta were. Test. Kind of beta, beta test. Yeah. And then we did they, a major... They thought they were having fun. We were making them work. Right. And at the end, <laughs> they had a big survey they had to fill out for us to say, we Perfect. like this, we didn't like that. Perfect. You know, you should do it this way. Help us price it, you know, because we didn't know how to price it. Taylor they, said there was about 35 of them? Yeah, yep. yeah. But mm-hmm. there were there were... A few things that we did that were just kind of an afterthought that in, that they really liked, and I thought, well, I'm so glad we did that. But Saturday night, for example, we set up a really long harvest table. We roast, had been roasting a whole pig all day long, and then and then we invited all the neighbors to come up. Now, I didn't oh. think that they would like. I mostly wanted the neighbors to know what we were doing, uh-huh. but you know, here comes an organic farmer and a sheep herder and a pot grower and a, on and on and on. And they were all, the, 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 the guests loved uh, being able to have sure that experience did. with them. And the neighbors loved being able to they, see, meet new people. It was, I, I was so surprised it, over. It was yeah. one of those, we, cool. we knew yeah. something like that could happen, but we had no idea it would. Everybody's talking about it. It, it Not just the Airbnb people, but the uh, neighbors are all yeah. saying, Wow, you had a great celebration up there. No, this was a business meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, to, and like we, I, we had just happened to be at a coffee shop in Canyonville, and we heard these two women that were in there singing. We said, you know, your voices would sound really good on the meadow. So we hired them to come up and perform at night after dinner, and the sun was setting, and their voices just echoed, you know. That was perfect. Campfire was in the front. I mean, it was just, 
you know, it, and it was just magic. It really was. And the stars came out and the whole thing. And I was like, hmm, this uh-huh. is going to, yeah. yeah. That was last weekend. This weekend poured down rain. So it's a good thing. It was last weekend. Oh, what if that had been this weekend? So you, did, the, did the people in the tower come and join you too? Well, we no, didn't, we, we had nobody. Oh, didn't it, we were either. in the tower. Okay. We were in the tower. We because okay. we made it the club. We made it the clubhouse so, and, and yeah. the place where Tom did most of the cooking. Oh, okay. So we, yeah. We, so some of the meals we actually served up in the tower because uh-huh. we basically had. But you couldn't get thirty-five people up there. Oh yeah, we could. Really? Yeah. But, as the engineer said, as long as they don't all stand on the balcony in the corner, you're probably okay. fine. Oh, yeah. for heaven's yeah. sake! Yeah. So we, you know, it was kind of it was like a bit, it was like a party up uh-huh. there kind of thing. So we. Like the first night, we had a meet and greet because we had people that were arriving at all different times setting up their tents. So we just had basically a, a big buffet that was open until 11 o'clock. And so people just came up and, you know, this, they didn't all know each other. So that was a good way for them to meet each other. And we were able to, you know, serve out of there. And then uh, for the big meal, we served it downstairs where we had all the room. And we I had saw the, the camp picture. Fire. Yeah. yeah. You now need that we, picture on your website if you don't. Yeah, it's, okay. on, it's, it's on the on website. website. And it's yeah. also... Yeah. Did, you, uh, did you build another... Pit toilet for that group? No. Well, we have we two. Have two. You have two. Yeah, okay. we have one for the lookout and one for the summer house. Okay. And, and they see, both have showers. And, well, they don't have showers in the pit, pit toilet. But, but no, but I mean... Each, the, each house has yeah. a shower. Right. right. So, so you're, you're that the house summer that house you're constructing. Has a, they're right. both the out, house. outdoor right. showers. Mm-hmm. The summer house shower we could make more private. So if anybody really wanted to take a shower, they could. Mm-hmm. Many people said, I'm not here long enough. I'm not that dirty. And I don't think I smell. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, but I don't think many people would have used the, t- the shower on the lookout because it's you know pretty exposed. And- <laughs> oh, 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 that's right. That's Which is great right. if you're there by yourself. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's a great feeling to be out there, you know, forty feet in the air with you know acres and acres around you, and deer and, and, and deer you. and turkeys. Are but I'm not sure you want to do it if there are forty people on the ground. Right there, right there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So you will be then marketing to people who do events, um, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we, in and fact, um, one of the one of our Airbnb uh, guests, I do know Audrey. Uh, I haven't met her. Um, she said, "Oh my goodness, Nike and Tell and all these nonprofits up here would. This is like perfect for them to come and do a creative retreat." And we frankly hadn't thought about that as a possibility, but sure it is. So that's another piece. I that think we have you'll to find think. that there's a lot <clears throat> of interest in I, that. I yeah. think so too. Yeah. So we it's have pretty to, far. We, that's we have to gear yeah. ourselves for. Yeah. This kind of migration. And, and part of it is because we booked so far out. We, you know, if we're going to do that at this point, we couldn't even do it till 2018 because we've already had promised 2017. So, you know, th- those things you just get so far out. Really? So yeah. you couldn't you couldn't do both. You couldn't have gas up in the lookout. And... You no, know, it's such a different mindset. You know, um, Sam and Brene. Do you know Sam Nelson? He works in the hut. Um, team he said to us as we're sitting because they came down for the um, last weekend and they had also been there by themselves before and it's such a different dynamic to be there quietly privately with this space all to your own on your own and then to put somebody up there and say oh and by the way we're going to have you know 40 people on the land or whatever to camp it changes the whole feeling mm-hmm. of the space yeah and it's not it's not the same feeling and I don't find it. That wouldn't be fair to the people. It's not yeah. fair. Plus, we really, not, we really need the power to, to, to do the event because that's where the kitchen is. And oh, we, okay. And all that kind of stuff. Now, what we're moving toward is trying to figure out a way to include the community up and down that river mm-hmm. in this venture and for them to embrace the idea that there's another source of income that could come to them through this tourism idea. But we're gonna, that's a long-term strategy. One thing to have somebody do a tour of their farm or to take them out to see beaver dams being built by the colonies, it's another thing to say, I will be a, a host and I, I will Im, Im, invite people into my home. Because many of these people moved out there just to get away from people. Right, yeah. right. But if they can control it, it, of course, you know, that's probably the biggest thing. Is, but they don't know that yet. Yeah, and that's yeah, part of our, yeah. our game plan is to help, help them figure that out. There's a few who are willing to step up and say, I have property and I think I could do this. Um, but it might not be necessary for them to actually host people to stay. Right. Like, yeah. you know, I've never seen a 
pot farm. I've never, right. I don't know how to hurt. I don't, I've seen people cheer sheep, but I think yep. it would be really interesting and, to have, make lanolin or make yeah. soap. Or, Ab- I mean, I, absolutely. You know, and many of the uh, things that we want to offer is you could, you know, go to work on an organic farm or mm-hmm. harvest something. There's a lot of possibilities. Right. We just right. haven't explored all the details yet. Right. But, but what I've also noticed is that once we started talking about this, then the neighbors started saying, well, maybe I could do this. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I could do that. Right. Things that I couldn't have thought of. Right. You know? right. And, 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 and the idea is that if we could expand that so that we had coordinated what we would call tiller weekends. So we had several hosts that were doing this and we coordinated all on the same weekend. So you had, you know, some critical mass on all these kind of things. Mm-hmm. So uh, rather than just one or two here or there. Because uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't think we could do that every single weekend. No. Uh, but first you of all, you'd get totally burned out. Yeah, we'd anyway. be totally burned out. I don't know if there's that much demand for it. Uh, we're doing two this year. If they're successful enough, we'll do four next year part, and see how it works. Part of that is to scarcity breeds a desire. Yes. And it, it, I mean, the reason why the fire lookout is so amazing is that the stories have been told and people want to be there. So we yes. have to restrict it, you know. And I think the camp idea, retreat idea, is one of those, if you do it too often, people are going to say, well, that, I, I just went last week. I'm not going to go this week. Mm-hmm. But if I can only do it twice a summer or, and then it's billed, then people start to get, there's a buzz about it that's important. You know? Yeah. Well, you guys are just fascinating. This is so cool. I'm so glad you're here. This is neat. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you think so. I will let me say this. One of the things we know that Airbnb it needs to gear up better for is how they engage government and relations. Mm-hmm. Um, and Douglas County is no different than any other rural county. Uh, it's a good old boy network, and we've got to build a, a deliberate strategy. To make sure that anybody who wishes to play in the in that short term rental game are are comfortable inside it and won't have some regulatory agency shut them down because yes. they weren't ready. Well, I think I, I think in Douglas County in particular, it's so large and so spread out and so rural and remote that at you know, this time maybe. Yeah. But you know yeah. how things can snowball. I yeah. want yeah, proaction. Right. I don't want reaction. Yeah. I want us to go after them and start the dialogue before they're ready. I to think talk that's about really it. smart. I don't understand why we should pretend like we're running under the radar. It kills you every mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. I don't want that to happen. Yeah, and that's part of what my conversation with Airbnb is about. Get in front of this, you know, before it becomes around to bite you. And we don't need to. Re- that's that's such an incredible, powerful impact pro- platform for raising prosperity in rural parts of the uh, country. And we need to be able to make it a, a priority, not just the major metro areas where I know there's a lot of money to be made. I got that, but in rural counties, especially this kind of extreme rural, where people are really struggling to find a, a way of making a living without having to be disability or on welfare. Suddenly you give them hope and suddenly you give them a way to control their own future. Heck yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Let's I, go mean, there. I, I think there's yeah. a real, real positive impact. Having always lived in an urban area, it has meant it has been a real eye opener for us to actually live in a really impoverished rural area. Cause they, as you, you know, you, I, you hear about it, but you don't really experience it. Now I will say this, they may make not much money, but they live well. Because they farm, and their food is amazing. We we have the best food with our neighbors uh, because they all know how to make amazing. Well, they, it, 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 we got involved with what we call the old hippies, and they all moved down there in the early seventies uh, when back to the, the, the back to the land movement was going on. And they yeah. were at the time they were in their twenties and they were young kids and all this stuff. So every week we have to go to some kind of a. Uh, vegan potluck or Taco Tuesday or I mean my our social calendar is so much more full down there than it was in Portland. <laughs> we often say our block in North there are more people that lived on our block in Northwest Portland than lived in all of the basin there. But, but we know every person in the basin and we didn't know very many people on our block uh-huh. in Portland. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's right. And the other thing that's really kind of cool about this is that you, we picked the location because we love the, the setting, and, but we had no idea who 
lived, if anybody lived in the area around us, you can ghettoize yourself. You find a place in an urban setting where people are like you, you know, you've got the same education, your same frame of mind for the world. Here, it's the spectrum. You know, there's born again Christians and, and then there's people who are atheists. There are people who are Wiccan and there are people who are Tea Partiers and then there are people who are rabid yellow Democrats. And so all of these people come together and they have meals together. It's amazing. That's to me. incredible. Yeah, yeah it's, that's wonderful. It's really been eye opening for me wow. and an experience I never thought I would have. And do you believe that it's Airbnb that has given you this experience? You think it's the platform that facilitates this, or is this you? Oh, that's well, a good question. I, I would say, from the standpoint, is that it took a lot of components for us to be able to do this. Mm-hmm. You know, just to be able to say, you know, we quit our jobs and go live off grid, and that was one of the components. And if we didn't have that one, we probably couldn't have done it. So I, I don't, I can't say that it was all due to that, but it certainly that was an important piece. We've had this kind of life almost every place we've lived. So it's not like, you know, we recreate our own experience. We had a first met in Dallas, Texas. We were very active people and big events, you know, a lot of fundraising, a lot of all that business, you know, big city, big car, whatever. And then we moved to Portland and essentially recreated the same thing again. Mm-hmm. It's part because of who it's we because are. Because of who you are. And then we moved down there and you know, we're thinking macrame, read, you know, write a book, be quiet. And then we got involved in all of this. So yeah, it's partly us, but we wouldn't have had the ability to pull people into the area if we hadn't had a platform like the Airbnb is. Mm-hmm. I don't think that would have popped just just it's so easy for us to get the word out. Uh, we would never have been able to do that otherwise. So I think yeah, it's both. Wherever we go, there we are. And you are you are highly celebrated on Airbnb too. So it really <coughs> behooves you to to you know continue to work. Well, with them. yeah. I mean, I, I realize in the big scheme of things, we don't really make a lot of money for them, but we're really good for for promoting their brand. Right. And they've actually spent a lot of money on us, a whole lot more than they'll ever make. But I realize it also you know it really promotes their brand. We're humbled, embarrassed by the amount of attention we get. You, you know, you're the, very colorful people. I mean, you know, yeah, the, whatever you that to, means. You know, when you go to the <laughs> Airbnb, vibrant. they go to the Airbnb office and they have all those little uh, huddle rooms, whatever they call them, that are the models that they're listing. Yes. Well, we're in the London office. Oh, they've recreated the, the lookout yeah, in the London in office. In the London office. Have they really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. We oh, offered, we actually, we actually offered to go I've consult with them to make sure it was precisely right. to give them permission to Oh, for heaven's sake. I'm grateful to meet the quality of people, and uh, I'm really, I'm I'm pushing the envelope. He is pushing the envelope uh, because we think that it, it has potential that's not even being realized yet, uh-huh. and it's time. It's more than time for Airbnb to step up to the big boy game. It's not just a bunch of hosts. I will say this: we're in this business as hosts with them. They can't exist without hosts. It doesn't work without us. And I need for them to, to treat me as much a, as a business partner as any company who has dealerships or distribution networks because we are the lifeblood and we have a lot of experience that w- will get transform what they're doing mm-hmm. in a really positive way for guests. Mm-hmm. I love calling it a guest experience, not a customer experience because mm-hmm. I don't like transactions. Is there anything I missed? Anything you would like to, to, for people to know about you? Part of the reason why this place is so special is that it is quiet. <laughs> and I, you know, originally I wrote the copy for this um, place for a fundraiser for Open Meadow School here. In, it's a private school. We Sorry. know Open Meadow. Our daughter went there. Okay. Oh. Well, there you go. Yeah. So anyway, I helped them fundraiser that they do. And I wrote this script, and my son and I put together a video of this to pitch it as a, as an auction item. And one of the things I tried to do was just think about what meant a lot to me sitting there on the property, and I can hear the birds way down the valley. And I can hear why the wind actually allows the trees to speak. Uh, it's it's it gives voice to the trees. That's what the wind does, and every tree has a different sound. 
And I started to realize that that impacts people in ways they can't identify. And I've had one of my close friends go down there and he was in, he was in trouble um, physically and emotionally. And it was a starry night. And he sat, stood on the balcony all night long singing off key, uh, Christine Aguilar's you Lift Me Up. Oh. And he was a mess in the morning because he'd been crying all night singing. And then he went back and reconnected with his family and his dad, and he's got a job, and everything transformed. So I know it's it's a transformative place for people. Mark Goatherd, a friend who lives down the hill from us, this is a rich place for the Native Americans. He maintains that their stories all include that this this meadow and the part down the hill where he lives with his wife were special ritual healing places people went to. So there's some level of energy and people, some people pick it up really fast. Mm-hmm. Gabney, do you have anything to add? We are at the point where we are constantly asking ourselves when we want to do one more improvement, but it, it loses a little bit of wildness every time you do that. For example, for the, the camping weekends, would we want to build little platforms for people to put tents on? Would we want to build little cabins for them? And then we say, yeah, but every time we do this, it loses a little bit more of its wildness. Well, I was not ready for that interview to end. I just had so much fun talking with them. They are so interesting and just the sweetest people. I hope I see them again sometime really soon. Well, that wraps it up for today. I hope you enjoyed that. And just a couple of little things I wanted to tell you. We have a new Facebook page, which you can find by going to Facebook forward slash hosting your home. I've been thinking about creating a Facebook group too with a membership so that we can, you know, interact, but I haven't quite gotten there yet. Oh, and I have a new Twitter handle. So find me at, I guess the hat that you do the at sign. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little new with Twitter guys. You do at and hosting your home. And that is me. You can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play. And of course, our website at hostingyourhome.com. So I look forward to doing this again next week. Take care. Bye-bye.